Hello, I'm Brad. And I'm Jason. You are listening to Dice, Dice in, in My Mind. One of the things that we haven't talked a lot of, well, we really haven't talked about it at all in the podcast, and we never really talk about it a lot otherwise because we're so deep into gaming discussion, is this idea of how robust the board game market is. Very true. Um, and I've always been a fan. I've always tried to find ones where I can solo because mm-hmm. there's no one in the house even close to being 5% as nerdy as I am. Not even. Um, not even. And no. I'm probably saying generous by just saying 5%. It's yeah, probably really. more like a half. Yeah. Um, I became a big fan. The, I'm going to sidebar here. Years back, you told let, me. Let the record show that yeah. approximately one and a half minutes into the podcast, Brad has sidebar. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, that's okay. Because <laughs> that's that should be my that should be my we always talk about trail names because we we hike and we bike. That should that's Maybe, your podcast trail name. Sidebar. That's my podcast trail there yeah, it is. sidebar. <laughs> right. um, um, that would probably have been better discussion offline, but oh really. Well. Yeah. Um you in around 2006 said you should watch this show called Firefly. You're yes. the one that introduced it to me. I never heard of it. Before. Yes. And your life um, is better because of it. It has, It is. I love that show. Yes. Um, and when the board game came out in 08 or 09, um, I picked it up and then loved it because it's actually, you can play it solo. Yeah. And I picked up the expansions as they came out at the time. It's now out of print. They, mm. They've run its course. Um, big fan of it. And big fan of a lot of the stuff that um, Gale Force Nine had done. They do Star Trek Ascendancy. I don't have it, but uh, um, yes. I've I've seen it played and I've watched it played at game stores. Um, yep, I've I've, those... I've seen the boxes at stores. Yeah, it's mm-hmm. fascinating. But my problem is, is that there are so many expansions that I'm afraid that I'm and run wisely out of space. so. Right. Yeah. I mean, you'd you'd need another I, basement. You know. Well, yeah. You know. Yeah. You know how I am with that stuff. Yeah. Um. But that, but in all fairness, all of those games like that, those miniatures board games, they're designed to be addictive, right? Oh, it's yeah. like Colonel Sanders. Yes. Oh yeah. yeah. It is. With, with his, his wee, wee chicken wee little eyes. Yeah, yes. His wee wee yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um. So. I've Man, this a is really a sliding quickly. Yeah. Well, yeah we. Uh, my sidebar took. A wee, <laughs> it's almost like a ninety or a yeah. seventy degree turn instead of a forty-five. Yeah. Way to use that um, math. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, we're going to head down a really slippery Anyways, slope. Yeah. Um, but big fan of board games. I picked up a couple over the yeah. holidays. Um, and one of the people that I I was searching for for someone to talk to mm-hmm. that lived in the board game world because you know I've yeah. talked about that for a while. Yeah, you have. And um, found Aaron Dill's contact. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk with him shortly. Yes, we are. But I don't want to give too much away, but. Um, a lot of experience in the gaming oh, world, in the man. board gaming world, yeah. in the miniatures world. Yeah, which is what attracted us to talking to him, that he that he has existed and exists so prominently in those other arenas that are pretty foreign to us, but adjacent to what yeah. this podcast is about. Yeah, and, and again, I play board games, but I don't do, like, I don't yeah. paint miniatures. I don't do that type of thing. It just, it, mm-hmm. just haven't mm-hmm. gotten to it, and yeah. since I do solo, it's just... Yeah, it's not the same, right? Yeah. But you've dabbled, no different than like for a while I played X Wing from, yes. from Fantasy Flight Games. And I I found it just thoroughly enjoyable. I mean, kudos to Jay Little. Um that the design of that is just so much fun. And it's a and we talk about that a bit and other games with Aaron uh in this episode, but um but like I say in the in the interview, you know, if you don't have something to play with, right? If it, it, mm-hmm. most of these games don't work all that well together, yeah. um, and then you just end up buying a lot of miniatures. Yeah, and and and, and you know, solo variants of board games. Now there are some out there like Mage Knight that are you could play solo. Um, I can't remember which version of. I know I think the new version of Dune has a solo variant. Firefly is a solo variant. Um, one of the games that I always was fascinated with, I have it, don't really play it, um, Axis and Allies. And, oh, yeah. And and people forget, you know, miniatures games and all that um, aren't necessarily high fantasy or fantasy in general or even sci-fi. Right. It could be historic. And you'll hear Aaron even talk about 
um, yep, not necessarily historic, but he uses, you know, you'll hear him talk about some of the gaming that he's done, even most recently, board gaming and miniatures game. So can't say either one of us are experts in this arena. Um, oh, no. But I don't think we could have gotten a better person to kind of introduce the podcast. Yes. To this content. I, I think that's right. And it, I think it's the same for us, really, to, to, to really introduce us or, uh, shall we say, really broaden our awareness of, yeah. of what's out there, especially because of Aaron's perspective of having played all of these different types of games mm -hmm. in and out of similar as well as different franchises, et cetera, right? I, it, it really was eye-opening to me, Brad. I, I've, never, I've never been much interested in quote-unquote board games. But I think up until our chat with Aaron, I don't know that I appreciated the real expansive definition of board games, especially yes. in this type, right, of like when we're talking about quote-unquote gaming and the RPG adjacent stuff, like I just didn't think of that. And then, then I look at all these publishers who are out there, including and especially, you know, like companies like Aaron's, and it's like, oh, so actually there's a ton of this stuff going on and it's super novel and some of it's simple and some of it's exceedingly complex and it's all well, and, and And I'm oversimplifying here and it comes from perhaps a position of ignorance in many ways. A lot of it, and you'll hear Aaron kind of talk about this and I'm not trying to quote him, but um, a lot of the older games that were, that really have kind of been the forefathers of modern you know, board gaming were European games that were brought over. And yeah. even you'll hear and talk about a 4X gaming, which is a mm -hmm. explore, expand, exploit, exterminate. Mm -hmm. um, 4X gaming became really prevalent and it's a big deal out of video games. Back in the day, Command and Conquer is a derivative of it. Civilization. Civilization. That was my baby. There's a big one out there called Hearts of Iron. Stellaris. I could go. I could go on and on about 4X video games. I don't have a lot of time to play those anymore because yeah, I'm right. too busy being yep. analog. But yep. but I've always been fascinated by 4X board games, like an Axis and Allies, even yeah, an, even a simplified one like Risk. Oh you know? man, brings back memories. Been playing that since at least junior high. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's where a lot of my world building. There's that's a story. I don't think we've oh, about for another interesting. day. Interesting. Yeah. Where my my love of world building came from, writing, literally writing fictional histories based off of Risk board games I played with a friend back in middle school. So oh, wow. we would we would in effect, you know, you know position that we'd go through the idea of positioning our, our yeah. units out on the board and then in yeah. effect creating our own empires and then drawing the boundaries and writing stories of the wars and the battles and characters and all that. Yeah, you know, you um, are you are right. The rest of your family isn't even five percent as nerdy as you are. Oh, not even. <laughs> not even. We'll go, let's just go. Let's just be realistic. Probably about probably not even half percent. Oh, as no. nerdy as but I am. but fortunately, others are. And I think on that, we should hop over to our chat with Aaron. Aaron Dill is a veteran of Games Workshop, Gale Force 9, and Monster Fight Club. With over 20 years in the tabletop hobby world, he's excited to be embarking on his new adventure of Jolly Lark Games. Over the years, he's run grand tournaments, designed gaming accessories, and collaborated on a number of popular board games. His work includes Firefly the Game, Star Trek Ascendancy, Spartacus, The Sons of Anarchy Board Game, Tentacle Town, and more. Jason doesn't do this as much, but I'm a kind of a board game nut, um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. more soloing or finding uh, ways to take multiplayer board games and make them solo. So um, I've known of your name, I've not creepy known, but known of your name for a number of years now um, because of my experience with some of the games that you were involved in the past. So thanks so much for joining us. Tonight. Yeah, happy to be here. So, yeah. you know, I, I think there's a whole aspect we talked about this a little bit before we hit record about the board game business because Jason and I really have it. This is the first discussion. You're the first person we're going to talk to about kind of the board game realm of tabletop game. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, 
I'd be curious just to kind of find out going back, back as far as you want, you know, with the, with the, the noises. Um, how did you end up getting into, you know, and I you know, did role playing pay a part, play a part in getting into board gaming? Or was that after? How did that, how did the genesis of all this come? That, that we, we can go way back on that one because uh, cool. I had a pair of dyed in the wool hippie parents who, uh, with five kids who didn't oh. have a television in the house, and I think nice. were kind of desperate for stuff for their children to do. So I was I was playing Euro games back before they were called Euro games. <laughs> but you know, my parents would buy us because we were all really close in age. Um, so my parents would buy these weird board games that nobody had ever heard of from the local toy store, but they were old Ravensburger games and you know German imports yep. back in the eighties. So I've been playing board games literally for as long as I can remember. Wow. Um, so that, that's, I, I, you know, playing board games from an early, early age and playing interesting stuff. Um, you know, Amazing Labyrinth, we have the uh, early edition of that, still my childhood edition of that in the, in the cupboard and wow. stuff, you know, thing, things of that nature. Um, and then got into D and D in middle school, which I actually think does have a little bit of a tie in to our attitude once we did start making board games later. Um, played D&D for a while and then got into alongside a bunch of miniature war gaming. Um, and then after I graduated from college, went to go work for Games Workshop, um, work, which is the the big 800 pound yeah. gorilla of the miniature right. war gaming. I'm sure almost anybody who's listening has heard of Games Workshop. Yeah. Uh, worked for them for about four years um, before then moving on to, I just knew, I that's what I was interested in. I, when I was in college, I was interested in getting my work done as fast as I possibly could so I could paint more miniatures. Um, you know, I was definitely phoned <laughs> it in in college so that I could paint more miniatures. <laughs> I, <laughs> I interviewed with Games Workshop my spring, spring break of my senior year um, and was basically told like, we're, we're hiring, we'd love to have you, sounds great. Can you start on Monday? It's like, ooh, that sounds awesome. But I think I'm gonna go ahead and graduate and then let's yeah. start in May. <laughs> You know, um, Seriously. so, and then, uh, and then Gale Force 9 was, uh, when it started, I was the first employee of Gale Force 9 in 2004, wow. when it was at that point, just a, a one person operation and John Kovaleski, the founder hired me on, um, to help grow the business. And for a long time, we made accessories for other people's games. We made tokens to make games easier to play and measuring yeah. devices and fireball templates and D and D spell cards and, we were kind of such jack of all trades gamers yeah. that we we would kept looking for opportunities to make other games better um, through yeah, tokens, dice, templates, scenery, that sort of thing. Um, and then we kind of saw, um, and it's this is going back long enough. I don't remember who's who's uh, generated the idea, but kind of this idea of like it seems like board games are really taken off. We're all big board gamers, yeah. and we had the opportunity. Um, to license Spartacus, the TV show on stars. Um, and that was the first board game we did as Gale Force Nine. Um, and it was just kind of this sense of like, before then with one or two notable exceptions, games based on TV shows, licensed games in general, yeah. were by and large terrible. You know, terrible, just right. right. You know, roll around, move, you know, roll to move, move and circle around a board. Maybe you draw some cards to right. that describe events from the TV show, really, or trivia games. Um, so our goal with Spartacus was to make a game, a licensed game that didn't suck. That was the official company like <laughs> strategy. <laughs> um, and and I, th I think we succeeded. I there's still I still sometimes get uh, contacted by people who are Spartacus fans who have a rules question or a suggestion That's or something. Cool. Um, and, and basically riding on the success of Spartacus and, and the, re the reviews it got, um, that let us talk to other people and, and pursue other licenses uh, that we were more interested in. You know, Spartacus was a good opportunity, but it wasn't like we were diehard Spartacus fans. Yeah, yeah. Um, but with the success of Spartacus, we were then able to do some games that we were diehard fans of, which is where what spawned... Um, Firefly and Star Trek. That's cool. Yeah, I mean, we those. I well, I don't know about Firefly, but my understanding, our understanding uh, of talking with people who do some of the licensing stuff, third party with Star Trek, they at least nowadays are not an easy one to work with. I mean, how did you guys land a huge contract like that? 
Yeah, I, that's that was not our experience. Um, all the folks at CBS when we were working with them, um, they were one of the easier wow. license oh. licensees to work with. Wow. Um, they were pretty excited about the concept. Oh, really um, cool! I think because I, so it kind of tangent into kind of our idea, some of our ideas, which is how it relates to some role playing um, of our board games, is that we yeah. very much wanted to make games that allowed players to tell their own stories within that yeah, universe. Yeah. Like when you're playing Firefly, um, for anybody who hasn't played the game, you know, all the characters you've seen in the show, it's only one season, there's not that many characters, but like <laughs> all, the, all the characters that you've seen in the show, they're in the game. You can draw Wash from the deck of crew cards. You potentially uh -huh. can hire Wash as your crew, but but it's not a reenactment. There, in no way yeah. are you trying okay. to reenact the events of the show. Uh-huh. It's trying to give you all the pieces that exist from the universe and in some sense let you tell your own story with it um it's not saying this happened and then after this this must happen and right after this, if you failed it if you failed to make this happen you have to try again because this is how it happens sort of thing yeah um so I, I think the the folks at star trek were just excited about the idea and that the star trek game was similar in that um, you're playing as an entire race. You know, one player plays as the Federation, one player plays as the Klingons. Right. I think we just didn't have to jump through that many hoops or there wasn't that much to object yeah, to. That's really we cool. weren't trying to say, we weren't mm -hmm. trying to put words in Picard's mouth or something like that. Got so it. Like, there weren't as many issues. That makes sense. Pick photos or, or representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's really interesting. It, 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 this is a rookie question. Uh, do you remember approximately when did that game come out? This, what would that put us? That would have been somewhere in the neighborhood of 2011, maybe. Okay, okay. Just trying to situate it within what was happening with CBS and Star Trek. You know, like, like you know, the ebb and flow of Star Trek over the past decades. Trying to put it. Twenty to put it twenty sixteen. Yeah. No. No. I mean that. Yeah. It was going well. So, That's really cool. Yeah. We it, the kind of a release. Um, event for it is that we went to the Star Trek's 50th anniversary convention oh, in Las Vegas and cool. kind of launched the game there. Yeah. That was right around when it was coming out. Yeah. Um, so we had a we had a booth there and we're running demos of it. And yeah. Um, it, that was an interesting experience, it, kind of because we're used to going to board game conventions where you know Gen Con, Origins, that sort of thing, where people mm -hmm. are there for the games, and at the Star Trek convention where people were there for the Star Trek. Yeah. But it's not necessarily that that Venn diagram of mm -hmm. Star Trek fans and board gamers right. has some overlap. Mm -hmm. But, you know, from the outside, you think like, ah, a bunch of nerds. The nerds like nerd stuff. That's, <laughs> that's not necessarily <laughs> true. <laughs> and there's been a lot of people who walk by who couldn't care less about a Star Trek board you've, game. You've obviously never spoken with either of our wives, <laughs> but, but go on. <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, you know, my wife's that way. My wife yeah. loves board games. That's yeah. part of how we met. And oh well, she couldn't, you could, couldn't really care less about miniatures games or funny um, other nerd stuff. So. Oh, that's funny. That's really fascinating. You know, with you, t you know, in terms of you know working at Games Workshop and then working at Gale Force Nine and all, and obviously you were at the, you know, at the outset of these of starting to design these games from franchises. I mean, what's the first step? I mean, you now you have. Yep. The, do you have to pitch, you know, if it's a licensed game like a like a Star Trek or a Spartacus or a Firefly or whatever? Do you have to kind of pitch the gaming idea to the company, or do you just kind of say we're going to design a game? Or? Yeah, I mean, a, a lot has changed in the the almost you know fifteen years or so since Spartacus came out. Um, that was Spartacus came out right at the cusp of what I what I think of as kind of the modern just explosion in board games. And yeah. there's been numerous, you know, at this point now, some popular board game, you know, Wingspan gets a, a New York Times article. Like that was unheard of 20 years ago that a board game would make, you right. know, uh, a New York Times article or something. Right. Um, right, so that was like right at the cusp. And I think we were really lucky that back then people. I don't know. People's expectations were lower. Board games were weird. Um, they they weren't super popular. They didn't. Fifteen years ago, board game licenses weren't that expensive to get because nobody was doing them. Interesting. Um, okay. So, in broadly speaking, you know, for a licensed product, generally the licensor wants some sort of guarantee. 
there's going to be in the contract, there's going to be some sort of guarantee and depending yeah, on yeah. what the, the pro, you know, um, property is, it could be anything, you know, from $5,000 to $500,000 mm-hmm. uh, guaranteed royalties. But back then it was not that much. Um, I think that what they wanted to see is that we were going to do a good job with the, with the property. They wanted to yeah. not make something embarrassing. Um, I think, and so the, but they didn't really care that much about mechanics. They just wanted it basically to present well. Um, Makes sense. You know, whether or not it was a a strategy game or a cooperative game or a legacy, they don't, they don't care about that at all. Um, but, you know, does it look good? Do you have a graphic design team that can put together a reasonably good looking yep. product? Yep. Um, but I think people have gotten pickier now. I mean, there's just a lot more people doing it now. Um, there's a lot more licensed board games out there. You know, now you go into a game store um, and hey, Brad, you've probably seen this. You go up in the game store and it feels like every third game is a licensed game. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that, that wasn't true 20 years ago. There was Battlestar Galactica and Dune, War of the Rings, you know, a couple okay. of Tolkien games. There just yeah. wasn't that much. I, this is maybe, maybe this is a little far afield, but just because I'm, you know, this is such a new area for me right as a gamer just the whole miniatures thing like we were talking before we went on air i just i've got very limited exposure and that's on me but i'm curious what you think as an artist as a creator as a maker of these things you know the it's like one day you've got this thing called 3d printing that maybe someday in the future is going to let us make something in a few hours and 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 like last what was it two two winters ago one of my friends got his kids a little 3d printer for christmas because he thought it would be cool i mean talk about fast development i'm just curious from from your perspective um are things like that have they been disruptive in a good or bad way what's it like these days where do you see things going as you know as, as someone who's artistic who's creative yeah i mean i think it's disruptive but disruptive not necessarily is just means that you know in the sense that it's going to change things, but I don't yeah. think it's bad. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I think that we're basically already there. Um, 3D printers aren't exactly as easy to use as, you know, our desktop printers. Mm-hmm. I don't know how to use them very well. Um, but my mother-in-law got my kids a 3D printer for Christmas. I have an See? unbuilt 3D printer in a box <laughs> in the living room right now. Um, I was just talking to somebody I know locally about That's doing cool. some 3D printing for me because I wanted some, some, uh, skulls and bones and Greek ruins to put on some bases of miniatures and he's going to print some of those out for me. So, you know, that, that kind of that future you're describing, it's pretty cool. kind of, it's almost already there. It's not exactly easy. It's not exactly fully safe because some of the resin stuff is pretty toxic. Oh, okay. Um, but it, it's an incredible boon for prototyping. I, I, I think what it's really oh, meant yeah. is that as far as uh, from a design and creative point of view, it just is so much easier to make something that looks pretty decent. Um, okay. You know, you don't have to play with cardboard chits anymore. You can design yeah, your pieces yeah. and then print them out. Um, and it means that when you're pitching games to a company um, mm-hmm. or to a, a licensor, you probably can make something that's reasonably well polished before yeah. you even leave your house. Um, yeah. which is, is just wasn't, yeah, you know, it didn't used to be the case. And you were asking about pitching, um, you know, pitching a licensed product yeah. to somebody is one can of worms, but a lot of board games, you know, get published, not dissimilarly to how books are published that, you know, a lot of games publishers, they're not designing their own games, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but they're getting pitched games by designers. Um, you know, a designer will send a, a sample copy of a game that's made with, you know, printed components and maybe some 3D printed pieces with a reasonably sketched out rule set. Um, and you know, there's there's a there's a bunch of different conventions around the country where you can bring a game that you've designed to pitch to publishers. Oh, that's cool. Um, you can mail a copy of a game to a publisher. You can you know, make a little one page, you know, sales you know, kind of white paper or sales sheet sort of thing. Yeah. Um, to pitch a game. And so that's the other avenue if it's for an unlicensed game. If you've just got a cool idea for a game, you yeah. can whip up a copy. You know, you can without too much difficulty whip up a playable copy yourself and show somebody and they can make a decision about whether or not they want to make 10,000 copies of it. Okay. Interesting. When you're, when you're sitting down at a table and like, you know, we were talking before it's, you know, it's obviously a team effort, like you had said, um, do you go at it from, okay, we're going to create this game based off of 
I'm going to just because Jason and I are nerds this way, Star Trek. Sure. What do we want the, you know, what do we want the goal of the game to be? You already have talked about it, kind of immersing yourself in the environment, but not necessarily replicating what you're seeing on TV. Do you already kind of have, do you have to come through as a group as to what idea the mechanic is going to be? Or, you know, how does, how does, I'm just thinking just like, I don't want to pick on any specific game just because I don't sure, want sure. to limit your, but like with Ascendancy, for example, you know, did you kind of have an idea when you pitched to CBS what you wanted it to be or mm. so did with, you? Yeah, yeah. So with, with Ascendancy, we knew, and when I say we, you know, working at Gale Force 9, it was a, definitely a team of three people that worked on all the games. Mm-hmm. It was me and Sean Swiger and John Kovaleski primarily, but with lots of help from playtesters and other people too. Um, we knew we wanted to make a 4X game of you know explore expand i can never remember all the x's um exterminate um we know we, we just we hadn't made that style of game before we all yeah. enjoyed playing that style of game yeah so from from the get-go we knew we wanted it to be that sort of galaxy spanning right exploration right. and conflict um and negotiation sort of game um so we kind of had our heads in that mode before that. And then that naturally lent itself to, okay, well, if we're going to make that style of game, mm-hmm. it makes sense that we're going to play the, we're going to zoom out and play a big picture game of Federation yeah, yeah. versus Klingons versus Romulans, et cetera. Um, but as far as how a more general approach, there's there's a bunch of different ways you can come at the problem. And we always said, I mean, you can, we said two kind of core philosophies of game design that we talked about a lot was that you can make a game about absolutely anything. Um, I mean, any TV show, certainly any movie, any idea you have, um, you know, and, and you've seen that a lot actually in recent years. It's been really fun. I mean, of some great games that have come out about being a cat lady, about quilting, about, you know, state pirates or anything at all. You can make a game about anything. Um, and given that, I think it's almost more important is that then there's no perfect game either. That was the other kind of philosophy. It's like, there's no right game that you're trying to arrive at. It, it, it's very much a, yeah, iterative process. Yeah. Um, but I think that the important thing to consider is what do you want the experience of playing the game to feel like? Do you want it to be cooperative? Mm-hmm. Do you want it to be tense? Do you want it to be a talking, negotiating sort of game? Do you want it to be a mathy dense can't say don't say a word i'm concentrating stop talking i have to think you know, sort of game um is to start with how you want the game to feel and then decide on what type of game would create that feeling in the players mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. see that's fascinating just because yeah coming at it it just it to me not being involved it just looks like such a nebulous oh yeah process you know, okay, what do we, like you said, what is the goal of the game going to be, you yeah. know, and every game, you know, I have, I have a couple that are sitting here because I was yeah. using my Dune and I have War of the Ring. So what were the, you know, what were the goals that they, when they sat down and designed those games, what were the goals just the same way you did the Ascendancy and Firefly and Spartacus and everything. Hmm. Um, you know, you, you spent an, you know, you spent a number of years doing that with Games Workshop and Gale Force Nine. Um, now you're doing something a little different, though, right? You're- yeah. So, and, and there's one other interlude in between Gale Force Nine. Yeah. Um, a few of us who were at Gale Force Nine together left to start Monster Fight Club. Um, so I was involved with Monster Fight Club from day one. Um, from and then did that for about about three years, two and a half years. Um, and then for various reasons, decided I was interested in uh, starting my own venture. And so left Monster Fight Club um, to start a new company, Jolly Lark, where I've been focusing on kind of uh, doing some consult- hobby consulting for other companies, doing some uh, painting yeah. videos and tutorials, and then also releasing, starting to release some, some products. So I did some yep. paint, miniature painting handles recently and then have a Kickstarter in the next couple of months that's going to be for a range of miniatures. Very cool. So. I, I, I have to ask, I noticed I noticed you said very little about Monster Fight Club. 
So is it true that what happens in Fight Club stays in Fight Club? <laughs> oh. No, I had to do that. I just had to do that. <laughs> we, no, we uh, we actually did a did a lot in just a couple of years, um, and they're still doing a lot. I'm I still I'm still friends with all the guys yeah. there, and um, I actually probably see a few of them next week when I'm uh, going out to visit Charlottesville. Um, but they did a, a license, actually a, a, an interesting intersection. I know you all talk about role playing games a lot. Um, yeah. They we did while well, I was there um, a miniatures game based on the cyberpunk red role playing game. Oh, um, interesting! So the cyberpunk combat zone miniatures game. I, I was uh, one of the game oh. designers on that. Um, we did oh. the Tentacle Town board game, which was our first uh, unlicensed game that was just an original idea of mine. Neat. Um, and then they also, right as I was leaving, they did a huge Kickstarter, multi-million dollar Kickstarter for uh, based on the Borderlands video game. Um, oh. and, then we, and then we also did a full, a big range of pre-painted scenery for that's been very popular with role play. Um, I actually think as much of that scenery has been bought by role players as much cool. as it's been bought by miniature gamers. Yeah. Okay, so that that actually you kind of beat me to a question. So listening to this, especially with some of the crossover, I'm curious what what you think. And obviously, as someone who's also gamed a lot, if you look at like the play space for RPGs, the play space for board games, um, in your mind, where how do those sit next to one another? Like you know, you mentioned earlier a Venn diagram of nerdiness, right? I mean, what like like what what would what's the draw? Let's say we've got someone being inarticulate here. Let's say we've got someone who's kind of novice to this whole thing, but is looking for something to kind of immerse themselves, maybe be a little social, geek out, have some fun. Mm -hmm. What would be the draws of like a board game where it just does it better than an RPG is probably going to? I think the thing, that's an interesting idea to think about what, what do each of those things do better? Um, or, or even like, just differently. Yeah, yeah, but like I think I think the thing that board games do really, really well is that they have a very uh, defined boundaries, yeah. um, with a few exceptions. But most board game rule books are under twenty pages, twenty or thirty right. pages, and even right. a thirty-page rule book for a board game is kind of long. Yeah, uh, many board games only have a two-page rule book or a six-page rule book mm -hmm. or something. Um, that board games, I, I think, are are this very contained, um, I don't know, nugget of fun that doesn't it doesn't spill out beyond the boundaries yeah. of that game that you're playing. Yeah. The board game begins and you play it for a couple of hours and it's over. And, and of course, there's exceptions of of legacy games or or whatnot. Yeah. Um, but I think there's a lot of appeal in that. You know, you can get together yeah. with a group of friends that you haven't seen in a year, mm -hmm. play a board game together, yeah. have a good time, and be done. Right. Um, it, do it doesn't require deep knowledge of the game beforehand. It doesn't require yeah. any planning. It doesn't require any follow-up. No session zero. Um, <laughs> and nobody, you know, I mean, my uh, younger daughter, my wife and I played a, you know, 20-minute game of King Domino before we I jumped on this call. Um just because you know, that's a game that's short enough that we can fit in between this call and when we finished up the dishes. Yeah. You know, you can you can slot board games in yeah, that's cool. to parts that's of cool. life that yeah. I, I think that it, the other thing that's great is that yeah. it doesn't require you to be a fan or to be a hobbyist of that specific game. You know, I can go over yeah. to somebody else's house, play their copy of the game, and just kind of have a have a good time and then leave it on their shelf when I go home. I, I'm right. I think something that's neat. I haven't explored this, but I, I'm I'm kind of fascinated by some uh, of the new role playing games systems that are coming out that are taking more of that attitude um, of a kind of a one shot paperback yeah. size role playing game yes. that's meant to be played without a lot of prep or yep. um, investment. Um, yeah, low and in, low investment. I think that's yeah. kind yeah. of what I'm trying to describe. You know, that that's that's interesting. It's and and so low investment i mean it lends itself to the duets it lends itself to even the solo games where you just you don't yep. even need a party you can just play for a while yep yeah um interesting and depending on the game you know there are cooperative games that everyone is playing to win or lose together um and there's also you know very there's cutthroat competitive games and, and a lot of it's just about who you're playing with yeah um and i think that on the flip side you know role-playing games that when i've been heavily into role-playing at times you know it's all about the 
story and it's not the the most fun i've ever had while playing is when the rules kind of disappear and you yeah. you forget about the rules right um which is not which is never true in a board game like you never forget about the rules in a board <laughs> game like that the board game lives and dies by its rules mostly yeah um and, and in miniature games from in my mind they kind of sit in the middle if it's a, a three ring venn diagram um, yes yes the board games are like maximum or miniatures games rather miniatures games kind of feel like maximum investment if you're going to spend 200 hours painting your miniatures <laughs> to, before you before you if you're somebody like me who only wants oh to play God. with painted miniatures you have to spend hundreds of hours painting miniatures oh. before you can even play at all and when you do play you bring 200 pages worth of rules to the table oh. um but at their peak when you're i played in a, a lord of the rings miniatures game tournament last weekend and oh. the store provided fantastic looking terrain i mean really yeah would be great for a photo shoot really fully detailed terrific looking terrain wow. my army looked pretty good my opponent's armies are painted and i mean two fully hand painted armies on a hand built you know expertly crafted scenic table yeah. with two players you know the rules well enough that the rules yeah. aren't getting in the way yeah that's a sort of immersive yeah, that's beautiful visual yeah. artistic experience that is hard to find somewhere else and kind of goes to the roots of RPGing and gaming to begin with. I mean, it's certainly it's certainly not foreign. Maybe just a bit in the past before we had all of this other stuff. Yeah, and, and I think you know, in the it's the maybe it's the difference between acting and painting. <laughs> you know, that both of them are artistic pursuits. But um, I think I'm a better painter than I am an actor, so maybe that's why I, 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 Look, I can't do either. Games. So good on you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just gonna. I, I have a. I have a. I have a it's not even a two part question. It's two disparate questions. Yeah. So when you played just out of curiosity, because you just mentioned it, when you did your um, the miniatures Lord of the Rings game last weekend, did you, what, what game engine did you use? Using, that? The, using the games workshop, uh, middle earth strategy battle game. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Um, okay. There's a, I'm in, I'm in the Atlanta metro area. So there was okay. 20 people in the tournament. There's a pretty good crowd. There's wow. you know regular gaming pretty it's nice to be in a big city that when i grew up i was in a much smaller town yeah and there was just less gaming in general back then but um you pretty much any game you want to play you probably can find somebody else who's playing it in the, in the city yeah okay For, and you were talking about like acting versus painting do you find you know is it a I, this is the wrong way to put this so i apologize is it like a therapy or catharsis or relaxing when you're there when you're there painting it's just a new thing for me and i'm just fascinated by the yeah detail. i i i mean painting is some people's passion and it's some people's albatross there's a lot of miniatures gamers for whom painting is a slog and they paint because they score painting points in the tournament and they paint because they feel like they have oh, to interesting <laughs> you know? okay um i i love painting i've, I've been painting miniatures since i was in elementary school um yeah it's super super relaxing put on a Put on a book. I'm re-listening to the Two Towers right now. You'll listen oh, to an cool. audio book. Listen to a nice. pod, listen to a podcast. Yeah. You can definitely do both at the same time. Um, and then the opposite. I I had, I don't know why I find miniature gaming in a way that is not true for board games or role playing games incredibly tense. My little you know wow. Fitbit watch thought I got like four hours of exercise. <laughs> at the tournament and my heart's just racing the whole time. Oh my god! Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which is not true for role playing games or board games. I'm not sure why that. Okay, is, but... admit it, Aaron. I, I just you can tell me I'm wrong, but I don't think I'd believe you when you're there at the desk painting. I don't care what you've got going on in the background. When you're painting, at least sometimes you are totally playing with those miniatures, with voices and everything. Be honest. <laughs> No, I really don't. I um, <laughs> so disappointing. <laughs> I, I was definitely. A, I I've never, and maybe I don't know. I've never was a kid who played with my toys very much. Yeah. Um, and, and maybe that's why I gravitate towards miniatures games and board yeah. games. But like, yeah. I'd build the Lego and set up elaborate scenes. And, oh, I see. But I never, yep. I never gave voice to any of the the Lego right. figures. I would, you know, right. I'd set up scenes with GI Joes and build backdrops to for them and build you know scenery to put them on yeah but but never you never voiced a character never told a story with them it was always yeah. about the the visuals and the display and Neat. um 50 years ago i would have been a model train nut you know oh <laughs> but, yeah absolutely okay 
you know, that, but that sort of, uh, I think there's something a little bit magic about the world in miniature. Um, there was a, a great, uh, I think it was the British Museum had an, uh, an uh, exhibit a while ago. It was all about miniatures. And there's just kind of something, yeah, I think there's something kind of magic about the little, little, little tiny versions of things, whether or not it's toy trains or dollhouses yeah. or toy soldiers. Absolutely. So this is a little unfair because, you know, as Master Yoda said, difficult is the future to see. But looking out, I don't know, five, ten ish years, do you think there are any interesting things coming down the pike for the miniatures world? I don't mean like like IPs or anything like do you, when you look at the tea leaves, do you see any trends that you think or hope might start to manifest that maybe we're not seeing a lot of right now? I think something that's really exciting to see now, and I hope expands in the future, is a little bit more willingness um, to try other systems. Um, I think mm -hmm. that 20 mm -hmm. years ago, it was Games Workshop or, or Bust. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it was really hard to wrangle somebody into a miniatures game that wasn't a Games Workshop game. Yeah. Um, and, and I all acknowledge that I'm totally setting aside a huge hobby of historical wargaming. Yeah, um, yeah. That there's Historicon, there's lots of conventions for it, but that's never that's that that's kind of almost another hobby. Mm -hmm. with, with there's certainly some crossover, um, but I feel like in the last few years, um, especially with the uh, advent of some of the the Star Wars theme stuff, I just I see yeah. people being drawn into the miniatures hobby okay. through licensed games like yeah, um, the Star the Star Wars game, the X Wing Star Wars Legion is a miniatures game that's got mm -hmm. lots of cool stormtroopers and Wookies and stuff. There's a the Marvel Crisis Protocol miniatures game that's bringing people in who are fans of the, the Marvel universe. Um, and I think that as those people come in, and I've talked to the people who had never painted a miniature for you know in their life, yeah. but oh, this little this little tiny Captain America is so cool. And yeah. what paints do I need to, you know, yeah, to buy cool. to paint that? And um, so I I I think there's a lot of people out there who probably okay. would enjoy that's miniatures nice. gaming who mm -hmm. haven't discovered it yet. And I think mm -hmm. that that just it's it's starting to break a little wider um, yeah that makes know, sense miniatures wargaming has always been a, a pretty relatively small yeah. niche in a niche yeah um, okay so as a player then got a, one more question as a player are there any franchises any ips that you would just love to be able to get into like to play like you would love to love to paint these things you'd love to see these on a table that just that don't exist. Mm, that's a that's a great question. Um, one of them almost exists, um, is not quite there yet, but I'm excited about its potential future. Is actually a project that Monster Fight Club started working on after I left. <laughs> so I'm not us. involved with this. This is not it's not self promotion. <laughs> yeah. um, but is the Witcher series? Um, oh, that they're making yeah. some miniatures for it now, which are okay. fun to paint. Um, but there's not a game associated with it yet. So I think that uh, I think a game associated okay. with that would would be pretty exciting. Yep. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing more fantasy. I think there's more fantasy properties and fantasy stories out there that could be tapped into mm -hmm. um, beyond beyond the Tolkien, beyond the Tolkien. -esque yes. And yes. Warhammer. Um, I think some of Brandon Sanderson's series would make really fun miniatures games. Um, I think the Stormlight Archives, the, the factions that are represented in the Stormlight Archives okay. would, could potentially be a pretty fun miniatures game, mm -hmm. um, stuff like that. Cool. Cool. I'll have to see where it goes. It's it's an interesting thing you say, though. I, 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 and I'll, I'll stop with this, but, but your comment about these franchises, these super popular franchises pulling in people to the games who otherwise wouldn't be aware, wouldn't look... Um, Boy, that seems to be happening across so many different realms of gaming, doesn't it? Whether it's miniatures or RPGs or whatever, right there, people aren't coming in because they want to paint or they want to roll dice. They're be they're coming in because they love this franchise. They love pretending to be in this world or thinking about this world. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that's that's true of the larger culture in general. I right. Mean, we're based right. only on your images I can see on the Zoom call. We're all of a similar age where that wasn't true 35 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. Hmm. You know, I, I think that, I mean, 
my wife and I have talked a lot about how God, like, that was, it is. That was tactful. I got to give you. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. That was I don't know what up. you guys are talking about. I'm 29. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, he, he's like, how can I say you look even older than me? But but, but do it so really well. <laughs> we, we've yeah. all got some no. gray in our beards. But, yeah, uh, some. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, and my, my wife's a little older than I am, a couple of years older than I am. And you know, we were, it was, you know, when in, being nerdy in the 1980s was really different than being nerdy is now. And oh. I, I think that that desire, I you know that, culture the, the larger culture has discovered yeah. the fun of immersing yes. yourself in a universe yes um and so i, I think yeah i think that's just going to continue my my daughters are teenagers uh one's in ninth grade one's in 11th grade and in the past week they have rediscovered to your point the big bang theory as as my younger daughter said to me this morning or, or yesterday in that the she, kitchen. That you remind her of Sheldon Cooper? <laughs> I, I, if you're paying attention, I've got a bit of all four of them in me, which is probably yeah. the problem. But, yeah. but she said to me, she's like, you know, I, I remember when we were little, you guys watched this and we and and you loved it and i left because you guys thought it was funny, but I didn't understand what was happening. And now these are young teenage women who are electing to watch what was like I mean, 12 years of this, just sheer geekiness that to your point, Jared, yeah. never could have gone in yeah. the 80s when we needed no. it. But now it's cool. It's it's super. Yeah, I, mean, I think it's great. It's both super weird to me and so weird. just terrific. Um, the, the news that rocked the miniature gaming world recently was that uh, Henry Cavill, who's the leading, who plays yeah. the, the lead so, in, yeah. the Witcher, yeah. in The Witcher, um, announced that he's in talks to do a Warhammer 40,000 something um, with, oh, see. Maybe with Amazon. And, you know, and that's the sort of like, it, yep. you feel it's as much as the nerd universe, nerdy pursuits has grown in the last 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. I think there's still a lot of room to, to go even further in it. Absolutely. Um, I feel like everyone I meet practically, I, mean, I, I run in probably relatively um, nerdy crowds, but I, I almost feel like it's rare to meet somebody who isn't like kind of like board games, you know, and yeah. maybe the board games they yeah. want to play are, are party games, which is, yeah. which is great. You know, they want to play the games that let them have yeah. a good time with their friends that aren't about necessarily winning or losing, but are more experiences. Um, but like, it's just not, it, it's pre, it's really become normalized in a right. way that, um, you know, my my uh both of my daughters have had friends ask them if they want to play D D and they're like, Oh yeah, sure. You know, that's cool. Right. Um there's a D D you know, big D D club at my nephew's school, you know, there's mm -hmm. just kind of it's, mm -hmm. it's out there in a way that it, it and I, I think that's only gonna grow. I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. Here's here's my traditional from far from left field question that is normally not a closer question, but how did how did you see um the table, you know, the, the board game, the miniatures markets and all that, how were they, and I, somewhat obvious question, how were they affected by 2020, the pandemic? And how do you, how did you see them kind of like bounce back? You know, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I've, and I'm, I'm not on the retail side of things. I've talked, I had a, I've had a few conversations with store owners that I know mm -hmm. um, and store owners that I've talked to over the phone about different things. Um, I think it's been, uh, I don't know, bifurcating in a way that the stores who really had their act together and who were beloved by their customers weathered it pretty well. Um, and the stores that maybe didn't yeah. have their act together and not, not to throw okay. stones at anybody and, yeah, and certainly yeah. Yeah. wishing everybody the best, but yeah. much like restaurants, you know, that um, stores, businesses that were beloved by their customer base, right. People rallied around them. People yes. um, kept them afloat and stores maybe where the customers kind of felt a little, not even negative, but just customer stores that weren't quite as beloved um, struggled more um, yeah. industry wide. It's been amazing. I mean, mm -hmm. people have never bought so many toy soldiers or paints or board games. Nice. You know, the, the past few wow. years have been a yeah. incredible banner year for particularly for miniature gaming, but I say this with no numbers or, or data to back it up, but just, uh, um, you know, things have been out of stock, supplies have been hard to get, not because yeah. of supply chain issues necessarily, but wow. people just had a lot of time at home. And, right. you know, uh, Brad, you were talking earlier about solo gaming. 
painting is a solo activity. You can't That's what paint, I was wondering. Yeah. You can't paint a one inch tall miniature together with somebody else. You could be painting your own miniatures at the same time with somebody else, but yeah. painting miniatures is a it's a pretty ideal solo activity. Yeah. Um, so that's what I was, I was just thinking yeah. the more you talked, the more I thought oh, 2020 must have been a banner year for folks who just wanted to catch up on miniatures painting. I, I it was record breaking for me. I've never painted so many miniatures. <laughs> and it's, year it's, a as shame. I did in 2020. it's a shame that, that, that our listeners can't see your background just cause you've got just the, the coolest, just the, the most beautiful workshop behind you. Right. And I mean, obviously they can see some of it, on your videos, but we have a bit of a different perspective where we can see the layout and it's like, just imagine the creative stuff and the fun, again, solo fun that you can have there, you know, which look, I, I mean, you're preaching yeah. to the choir on that. So. And if folks are curious to plug my own stuff a little bit, I'm certainly happy to uh, you know, check out if you want to kind of see what we're talking about or some of the stuff mm -hmm. we're talking about. I post you know, miniatures I painted pretty regularly on Instagram um, mm -hmm. and then painting tutorials on YouTube. Mm -hmm. uh, if you just search for Jolly Lark uh, yeah. really on either cool platform. Um, and, and I, you know, I very much, it, I'm very much focused on the gaming aspect of it. I mean, as much as I spend 90% of my hobby time painting, yeah. um, I've said for many, many years, like I, I only paint because there's a game at the end of the tunnel. Like That's if cool. it, what, if, yeah. if that painting wasn't game oriented, like I, could pull out a canvas or something instead or do paint by numbers or whatever like right. follow bob ross videos there's lots of other ways to paint <laughs> um you know my sister paints lovely little uh, miniature portraits of uh, east coast birds um you know she does watercolor portraits of birds and there's lots of different ways to be artistic um but for me the, the magic of it is that there is a game at the end of the tunnel that you get to you get to do this fun crafty thing and then also you get to play a game with it. <laughs> you know, it's, I, it's both. I got to say, Aaron, and maybe this is where we close. If you tell us at some point in the future, if we get an email from you saying you've done it, you've made a Bob Ross video <laughs> of painting miniatures, we're switching to a vodcast just yeah. so that we can, that would, just all those happy little miniatures. I, I would pay to see that. <laughs> I haven't played it, but there is a Bob, I mean, again, with that idea, <laughs> of throwing back to, you can make it. There's a Bob anything. Ross board game. There is a Bob Ross board serious? game. Yeah. Yep. So you can, I haven't played it. I don't know if it's good or not, but uh, there is a Bob Ross board game. I uh, thought so that he I'm had reached. Totally stuck there. Uh, I I thought he had reached reached social. What did you call it? Social saturation. Yeah, or the. Uh, oh my god. Ingrained in the in the modern day zeitgeist when he had a Funko, you know, I was walking through Target and there was a Bob Ross Funko pop yeah. and my son bought oh my it god. for me. Um, mm -hmm. so but a Bob Ross board game. No, Jason, I'm typing it not to buy yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, because I'm interested. Watch. Okay, yeah. wait a second. It's called. I hate to say it's called. Bob Ross, the art of chill. <laughs> oh, that's unfortunate. And no idea um, if it's any good, but I, yeah. you know, but to it's your all point, out there. You right, can make yeah. a game about anything. Right. Absolutely. To your point, you can make a game about anything and people uh, want to play them now. And a big wow. part of that is, you know, uh, we just passed the holiday season. A lot, a lot of board games are bought at around the holidays and a lot of board games. I mean, that's the, I think probably the single biggest power of a license of a recognizable name on the box yeah. is that if i know that you know jason i just know you love bob ross and you're right. just the biggest bob ross fan and i see a bob ross board game I'm like oh I'll yeah it's for jason he loves bob ross yeah. and yeah. that that connective tissue yep. that allows for gift giving um is, is a huge driver That's of board game sales i mean seriously who would say no to hey you want a bob ross and chill I mean, <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Hey, you know what? That that just I mean <laughs> before it wow. gets any worse. Yeah. No, no yeah, we, for... we really appreciate this, Aaron. This is really, really interesting. I mean, Brad, you've been in some of this. It's really adjacent for me. Um I, and I can honestly say I've <clears throat> I've never I've never been huge into board games. Like you think of the board games we grew up with, right? Sure. Like when I was little, but then never been huge. I I like being in the RPG stuff, but but truly after talking with you. I'm I'm kind of curious to check out some of this because the way, you know, this notion of let's play in this finite space that isn't asking for a, a, a huge buy of time, but let's take a couple hours and let's have this together and let's let's geek. That that sounds very appealing. Or a couple minutes. I mean, like I said, yeah. my my daughter, my wife, and I we played right. we played a start to finish 
from the time we opened the box to the time we put it away, 20 minute board game. Um, wow. Wow. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a huge amount of variety out there to fit whatever sort of style or feel or time commitment or yeah. rules yeah. you want to learn. There's, it, it's a, it, it's a really fantastic time for board games right now that you really can. I think there's a board game out there for everyone. That sounds a little, a little trite, but no, no, I, I think that's I true. Think I mean, I, right. I think you're right. Yeah. I play yes, board games awesome. with my 74 year old mother in law. I play board mm-hmm. games. I played board games when my kids were little with my three year old kids. And, mm-hmm. you know, it, mm-hmm. I, I really think you, anybody can enjoy them. Not necessarily everyone would enjoy every game, but there's, there's something out there for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure talking to you. Yeah. Thank you. No, this has been fun. You know, I, just before we, we cut over to Aaron, you had mentioned about, we were talking about the nerdiness quotient or the nerdiest ratio between me and the rest of the house. Um, you know, and yes. I was thinking to myself, yes, I, was. I was, I was thinking to myself, you know, you know, you know what qualifies that at my, what I call my old man chair, my recliner in the family room where I sit and yell at the kids to get off my lawn. Um, I actually yeah. was. See, now it's um, sad and nerdy. Oh, no, no, wait, it gets better. <laughs> um, I have the. Uh, I'm going to, this is a little bleed over into the jam corner, but I'm going to come back to it, but had to mute to call. Um, I have been, I have a stack, a stack, probably about 12 inches high of, uh, rule books for a couple of the gaming systems that we've been talking about (laughs) and a couple other things that I'll come back to, but that, that qualifies it. And luckily for me, I'm so smart that I, I stacked them. So the binding is on the other side, so they don't necessarily know it's role playing games. I'm just trying yes. to, and they and they don't call to you. No, yeah. and they don't, and they and and of course, I try to believe that just because they don't see the binding, they don't know that it's a role playing game book. Yeah, yeah, um, they know how nerdy I am. Going back to to uh, Aaron, yeah, to Aaron. What a nice guy, it, Aaron. It, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. You know it. You know, you had kind of talked about it. We, you talked about it with Aaron, just watching um, the work he does with miniatures, his new company that he's doing, uh, yeah, his first yeah. Kickstarter with yes, with uh, the holders for miniatures so you can paint, the detail involved in that, and the stories about designing the game. And, you know, you kind of know, if you know the franchise, we've been talking, it really this conversation has spurred other discussions we've had. If you know the franchise, what kind of game are you going to create? You know, with a, I'll go back to Firefly. Yeah. With a Firefly, you know, how did you determine, how did they come up with such a cool game mechanic? You know, you could take, like we talked about, you could take a franchise and make it, or make it a group, extremely easy and generic and boring mm-hmm. board game. Yeah. I remember an episode of The Office um, where they had the rummage sale and, uh, Kevin Malone from The Office, the character, had the Dallas board game for the TV oh show God. Dallas. <laughs> it was just it was just on recently. And when I saw that after we interviewed Aaron, I thought to myself, well, here's an example of where oh they took God. a franchise and made an extraordinarily generic board game out of it that looked like a mix of Monopoly and Life, um, rather than something really different and unique like they've done with, you know, all of these games that are out there, not only the ones that, that Aaron was involved with, but Dune and Middle Earth yeah. and all of them. Well, so. and to your point, Aaron's Aaron's been involved in so many of these games. Yeah. Um, it's just remarkable. Now, I, so, okay, so your, to your point about this office connection, I didn't say anything during the interview, but let's see, a few years, was it, was it at the start of the pandemic? Um, I have to think about this. So uh, I don't remember if it was the winter before. It might have been the winter or so before when when we had a really cold winter. So my girls uh, over one winter break. So yeah, I think that was three winters ago. Uh, from yeah, that was three winters ago between trips. So my girls uh, had this interest to play the game of life as a, yeah. as a, as a yeah, which is a great game i mean it's it's quite clever and so but as we played a couple times they became dissatisfied with the oh. with the creative limitations so they spent 
two or three nights in a row redesigning. They cut out overlays. They wrote them out. They illustrated them. I'll just send you a picture. And they, yeah. they taped them to the game and largely transformed the game so that it wasn't just so, as they felt, banal. And you had more interesting options and you had some hiccups and there was some humor and and literally redesigned like a quarter of the tiles on the 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 path of life and and to your point it was just it was very innovative and it was very clever and it really made it more fun to play see that is that's ingenuity i i was impressed i'm actually quite impressed i'm also i love your girls but did they actually use the term banal or did you no that's totally mine that's okay good good. that's that's that's, you haven't rubbed off on them completely okay no, so, no. I mean, you know, they walk around looking at my wife and at, at, at Amy and me, and they're like, they're like, how droll. No, not really. <laughs> <laughs> and then they put on their, what my ber- kids probably do. They so. they put on their berets and they take out their cigarettes and they walk away. <laughs> <laughs> Is no. it with the black and white striped shirt and they walk around going, ha ha? Right. Like and when they approve of something, they gently snap. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I was talking with my wife about beatniks this week. And so now you just, that's like the second time. So hold on. I think we have to move over to the GM corner before we get into beatniks. But to recap then, Aaron, from us both, thank you very much. Because you really did open our eyes. And I think, I think, Brad, it, it shows us just even how broader and more interesting and robust the RPG and adjacent world is than we realized right there are so many other things that people are doing that are like a venn diagram a little bit or a lot they're crossing over well I, two things one yeah or three things one yes aaron thank you for taking the time uh two you've opened the door for us to go into a um a area direction. of gaming yeah. Yeah, that seriously. we really haven't broached before and i hope the folks that listen um realize that there's this whole genre of gaming out there that's right. Um, that is available. That folks folks may just think board game is Monopoly, Life, Parcheesi, yeah, whatever, and they don't. And in the games that are out there now, even if you go to like a Barnes and Noble, it, there's a lot there now. You can look there mm. if you want to. Instead of looking at it online and guessing, you can actually yep. go and see these games and or, like yeah. a, even a gaming store too. The gaming stores. If you go to your friendly local gaming store, they. I mean, you. When I came to Milwaukee to visit, we went mm-hmm. through, and let's face it, they had more board games yeah. and box games than they did RPGs, right? Because they yeah. sell, and I mean, holy crap, are there a lot of choices? And some of the big publishers, right? Not not like. Not like the the Hasbro's, but some of like the big game publishers, right? They there's a bunch of stuff coming out right now, and it's yeah, sci-fi, I mean, it's fantasy, it's otherwise. As an example, go on and look on. I'm just gonna. I'm not advocating it. Just advocating buying from any specific place. But if you look on Amazon and look up Dungeons and Dragons board game, people don't necessarily know there are some See, right really robust games. Big Bang Theory had an episode or two where it showed the guys playing D and D board games rather than D itself. Oh, interesting. So, because they have the box on the table next to it, and I recognize the box. What is on your desk right now, or what's what's caught your attention, or what are you working on? Oh my! Oh my God! Um, (laughs) Not including, I mean, loaded question. Um, And there's there's stuff that we haven't talked about on here that you and I are doing together. Yeah, yeah. There, there. um, There's a. There's a lot going. Uh, there's a so okay. So I, I'll 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 limit it to this. Um, as this episode drops, we are ten days away from season three of Star Trek Picard. Mm. Yep. I don't know. I I right. I, it, it it drops on the sixth. I, Wait, are you saying mm, like you're not like you're disagreeing with the time or mm, like you're not excited? I'm, I'm excited. I'm just, I, it's like, it's kind of like, uh, uh, you know, like my kids growing up, there's like, it's like Christmas Eve, except Christmas Eve is like 10 days long. So. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 you know, I have obviously like, I think like a lot of viewers, I have some concerns. I loved season one, right? There were two or three episodes in the middle that were a little weaker, but they were still good episodes. Great season. I loved the first and last episode of season two. 
And it almost pains me that that whole season was simply not necessary. No disrespect to the writers. It was beautifully written. It just wasn't a story that needed to be told. I, I like the Guinan portions that occurred in them. Oh, I, I like love, seeing yeah. young Guinan. Oh, you know? yes, thank you. I mean, there are things I loved about it throughout. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And they did that really well as a retcon. But, um, you know, it, it whatever. Uh, it, but it's still, it, it wasn't what it could have been, should have been. And with, with Terry Metalis leading season three, uh, and, and, you know, like as we record, um, there have been a bunch of uh, journalists who've seen like the first half of this season and they are, you know, nearly exploding with enthusiasm. And, you know, you get some of that anyways, like they get to, you know, they're in it, they're into it, they get to watch it, they're excited about it. But the commentary has been uniformly along the the direction of this is what we've been waiting for. And um, and so this is what I've been waiting for. I am, I am really, really uh, looking forward to this season coming. And then, you know, if this is what, this is why I lose my job because I just have to keep binging these episodes. I think it's going to be worth it. Thanks for that. Ouch. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in a job transition inside. I, I can go. So, um, no, no, it's funny. Cause I think GM, I think our GM corner is going to kind of be focused on, on uh, TV and video media, just because similar to you now, I've, I've notoriously been horrible about avoiding spoilers. Um, I'm trying to, you know, yeah. I have, I am, I am not reading much in the way of any journalist Good for you. regarding the episode. I think the only thing that yeah. I do watch are the trailers. Um, yep. yep. And, and we talk about it, but you don't give out anything. If you've seen anything, we don't talk about it in that context. No, no. So I want to go into this fresh. Cause I, I really do want to see cause of the cast they brought in. Oh man. Um, I want to see, oh, I, it, it, it to me feels like, I really hope, I love Star Trek VI as kind yes. of a wrap up. Yep. I kind of want to see this, this season kind of be TNG's Star Trek VI. Okay, so here's my, here's my hypothesis, and I'm willing okay. to put very little money on this, but, okay. but here's, my, here's what I'm thinking. I think, I think what we should do is we should start using what are called Kaufman credits, which are one Kaufman credit is one shred of your integrity so how many kaufman credits are you going to put on this? i mean i don't have a lot of credits to spare here um <laughs> um but but you see, don't have to go you don't have to go yeah, there see, I, was, um, I was trying to befuddle you and i succeeded i i mean so. yeah i mean i can offer you something else worthless um <laughs> so uh here's here's what now part of this is just me hoping but yeah. this is how i'm reading the vibe if they did this quote unquote right mm-hmm I think that season three, because remember season, I mean, they're just talking about it blindly because, and this, this is how some of the, not like Strange New Worlds, um, uh, not even like, uh, well, not like Strange New Worlds because that's like of the week kind of stuff. But if you like Picard is one of the shows that's highly, you know, very serialized. I think we're going to see a mix of Wrath of Khan first contact and then an ending that will be somewhat reminiscent of the undiscovered country undiscovered country no to stay with the film metaphor i think you're right i think i think the bulk of it's going to be con slash first contact and then it's going to like you know like if it ends with all of them signing the screen we're going to know but still i um, still get emotional when i see that ending i still do oh end of all good things is the one that gets me yeah, that too. That that's but, the one that gets me. But the mm. song at the end of uh, I remember seeing it in the that, theater, thinking, "Oh my god, that's beautiful." Yeah. Wow. Yeah. The only other time that I I got really emotional about a Star Trek thing was when because you and I went and saw First Contact three times in the theater. Sounds right. Um, we saw it once. We saw I don't even we remember. Saw it. Did we? I'm oh yeah, sure that's true. Yeah, because because we saw it once and then. Um, I came to visit your place. We were just going to hang out. We're like, well, what do you want to do? And we're like, let's go see first contact again. Yeah. Beautiful. So, and then there was one more time. I think we went, I think we had someone come with us. I would imagine Eric yeah. or yeah. someone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, that beginning, that music, Jerry Goldsmith's music. Oh, ending a first contact. 
some of my favorite and i'm a and i'm a composer now. um mm-hmm. that's why when we had um nami on and talked about composition because oh. you know oh you know, i mean when then, i was when i was still when i was single right yeah. and still milwaukee I would often at night, I would, when we would talk about it, I would yeah. put first contact on in the background, the soundtrack. I put the disc yeah. up. Yeah. Right. Because it's so good. It is some it is the it is one of the most profound soundtracks. And I love soundtracks, even obscure ones. Like one of my favorites is Crimson Tide. I'm, so I'm so good ever. too. Oh you man. Know? So yeah, but but that music with yes. their signatures and everything, it's emotional because I, that was I grew up with the movies before even the TV series. Ditto. That my my consciousness of Trek was mm-hmm. my consciousness of Trek was all of the films starting mm-hmm. with the motion picture, and also there was the older show. Right, like yeah. you you had you right there were the but like I've still never seen, I've I've never seen at least half. I I'm, I'm outing myself. I've never seen at least half yeah. of TOS. Oh, I, ditto. Right, we grew up with the movies. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. No, okay. So I kind of waylaid this yet again. Accidentally. No, that's fine. Track. What, what's you on know, your... For me, yeah. for me, I, you know, like I've mentioned before, the summer was kind of a wash because a lot of stuff going on. I have some t- open time now um, before I, I, I start my next job gig. Um, so I actually have, I've, I've told you this, I track the shows and things that I want to watch that I haven't seen yet. Yeah. And one of the ones we've talked about is, uh, Legend of Vox Machina. We've talked about it multiple times. Yes, and I've I've seen the second season now. Yep. yep. And so I've watched through it. I have not seen the sixth episode yet. So no no spoilers. Oh sorry um, sorry I've, yeah I, right I've I've yeah. watched the halfway you've seen, point, right? you've, seen the okay. first, you've seen the okay. first you've seen the first six. Oh. But well, I'll be um, curious what you think of the sixth. Yeah, so far loving it. Mm-hmm. Um, it is I I don't think they went for as much shock value as they did like in the first episode or two they didn't know nope. and i'm glad because it's, they've, it's matured story. as a show yes 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 it is I, really matured as a show it's really well done do you have the soundtrack i do but i haven't listened to it i actually so okay so full disclosure i when when season one came out uh and I, I I thought, okay, I don't know if I'm going to like this, but I'm going to give it a shot. And I started, I watched the first few episodes, or we both did, watched the first few episodes of The Legend of, of Vox Machina. And I thought the soundtrack, while watching, at the start of the episode, like the first, I'm like, first episode is like, this is awfully cliche. And then by like the third or fourth episode, I found I'm really getting into the soundtrack. Like, this is really mm-hmm. solid work. And so I was curious, so I, I, I you know, I downloaded it on, on, on Amazon Music, and I gave it a listen, and I thought, oh, that's surprisingly solid. And with it coming back out for season two, I, uh, I've listened to it a couple times in the office now. It's, I'd be curious to, to, to hear what you think of it as, like, background or work music, right, thinking music. I have to say it's um, it's pretty good. However, I also had had it going in the car while on my way to pick up one of my daughters and her friend and realized that not only is it really good music, but it's also occasionally interspersed with songs by Scanlon. Oh, so, and could, they hear, could they hear that? No one was in the car with me, but when I picked them up, I turned it off. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> It's kind of a it's kind of a banter thing between Jason and I that Scanlan is like one of my favorite. It's your alter ego. It's ever. so your alter yes. ego. Yeah. So favorite. I love that character. Yeah. Um, I'm a big you know, like we just said with soundtracks, getting the chance to talk to any composer and oh. listening to their mindset as to how they came up with with that music, having been trained in it as an amateur. I shouldn't even say that because these folks are professionals. I was just a student. Um, yeah. yeah. But hearing that, and so I haven't listened to it yet because I don't want to until I've seen the whole series. I've yep. finished everything. Same thing, I because I found it interesting. You and I have talked about this, and I'm gonna I may make a mistake here, so I apologize in advance if I have to do a retraction. But <laughs> I know they haven't released Picard's full soundtrack yet because um, Terry Mattala said I think they oh. can't really do it because there's gonna in effect be you spoilers mean for, for season three. 
Yes. No, he yeah, he said he said right out that there are yeah, he he posted on Twitter that there are too many pieces that would give too much away cuz he's yeah. only he's only um he's only dropped a few clips, but I will this is another reason why I'm I'm very optimistic about season 3 because I've I've listened to those clips over and over and we are talking about massive beautiful you know, uh, Goldsmith esque kind of kind of. I mean, woo, man, is that? Yeah, I'm with you though. I'm still waiting for a Strange New World soundtrack to drop. Um, I'm really wanting to listen to that. Yes, and I don't know why it hasn't. I haven't found any updates on that. Um, okay, before we wrap up, since yeah. again this became the All Star Trek podcast yet again, people deal with it. It's where we are. Sorry. Um, but anything wait else? Wait a second. On... Wait a second. Wait a second. Star Wars. I'm also there. now afraid. we've talked about something okay, else. Thank so you. Now well, we could... Yeah. Uh <clears throat> no, I'll talk about okay. like, I, like I mentioned, I have a stack of books um that I'm working through and mm-hmm. and and it's the height of nerdiness and I am yep. um, loving it. And and I've talked to you about this with, with the job change thing going on. You know, I I put a lot of myself into my job. So now I have this extra like I have these extra brain cycles to be overly right, literally. simplistic. Yeah. And I'm enjoying it right now. I'm in this little honeymoon period. Where I'm doing things that I just was too mentally tired to do. Awesome. And so awesome. we'll talk about that during the next GM corner because yes. I'm like full on nerdgasm uh, in terms of some of the stuff that I'm reading and doing. Yeah. Um, love it. Well, on that, everybody go wash your hands. Think happy, <laughs> clean thoughts. Um, uh, uh, we, we appreciate all of you sticking with us and indulging us as we have moved to our biweekly format uh hopefully it's it's getting all of you uh, enough dice in mind um it, it's really helping brad and me out we've got a bunch of stuff in the works in the background for and beyond the podcast uh, as we get closer to that we will be talking about it very specifically very transparently we're trying to get pieces in place as we've said in the past to grow the brand take the next step and um so far so good Toward that end, we will say the upcoming the upcoming episodes, uh, the upcoming interviews, uh, really interesting as always, uh, really divergent people um, in, in terms of their backgrounds, interests, scopes of practice, professional and gaming and otherwise, a uh, bunch of leadership coming back your way in the future, and uh, and then we're going to be hopefully talking with some people. Uh, across a number of games, platforms, etc., more and more doing our thing as we uh, as we explore this wonderful world of RPGs and real life and uh, all these wonderful people uh, involved in it. So as always, be well, stay well. We will see you in two weeks. <laughs>